I'm not going to lie. I'm glad my wife didn't come walking up here, right there, right there, getting ready to pray. <laughs> I love my children, but three is enough. And I got to rebuke one of my elders on there. He needs to help his wife out a little bit more at home, apparently. <laughs> Neither threw him under the bus. Um, but uh, good morning and happy Mother's Day. As we celebrate Mother's Day, uh, it is a special day that we celebrate people that truly are a true gift and treasure from the Lord. Uh, individuals who God equates his love and his faithfulness and his steadfastness to the love of a mother. And, uh, and what, a, what a special honor it is to, to celebrate mothers uh, as, as I get to celebrate mine as well. Um, but as, as in any time, in any celebration, when you think about special occasions like this, uh, as even Blake was saying in his prayer, that there are, there are many, many women out there in hopes of becoming mothers and that are struggling. Um, there are those that may be even in this room today where this could be your first or one of the uh, Mother's Day without your mom, and it may be hard today. Uh, and just want you to know that you are in our thoughts and that you are in our prayers, um, that sometimes when you celebrate, uh, it, it is, is hurtful in, in a way to some. Uh, and we just want you to know that, that as we celebrate moms, uh, that we are thinking and praying for you. Uh, and I think that that's something that we always need to be mindful of and thinking about when we celebrate, that we need to remember that there are those that, that are wrestling through and struggling in seasons and times, uh, and we want to love those folks through that. So, uh, But today we are taking a break from Corinthians, and we are going to be looking at how to honor your mother. Uh, this is something that I am learning still to do this day as a grown man, uh, that it do, just because I left the home does not mean that honoring my mother uh, is not something that I've been called to do. And I think that as we have been called to bear the image of Christ in the world that we live in today, I'm going to use uh, Jesus and his mother as an example this morning about how we can truly honor our mothers as we celebrate them on this day. And so when you think about uh, the Old Testament and you think about uh, God's commandments, the, what he, the law of Moses that, that God gave to Moses, he gave him the Ten Commandments, right? And the first four of those Ten Commandments have to do with our relationship with God. One, that we should have no God but him, that he is the one true God, that we should not have any idols or create any idols that would put separation between us and the Lord. Uh, we have been promised and we have been told not to use the Lord's name in vain, uh, something that uh, we pray that as young children we never drive our mothers to do, uh, but it is a commandment that we give that has been given, and we also are commanded to give of the, to take and keep the Sabbath day and to make it holy and to remember the Lord. But then in 5 through 10, those commandments are given. It's how we have are in relationship with one another. And you think about how they're built into being in relationship with one another. There are the things where you do not murder, you do not commit adultery, where you do not steal or lie or covet. All of these things that we would think that would be common sense in how we relate to one another. But before we even get into those, the Lord gives us the fifth commandment, which is simply to honor your father and mother. And he says this in, in Exodus 20, 12. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And this, as even Paul will write in Ephesians chapter 6, as he says, this is actually the first commandment that was given with a promise. It was a promise given as we love and as we honor our fathers and our mothers that the days will go well for us. And he's talking about this in from two different perspectives, if you will. One is obviously the respect and obedience factor in honoring your mother and your father. And when we think about for our lives and how we respect and honor our parents and what we do, especially for our mothers, and we honor them and how we treat them, how we speak to them, how we respect them, how we are obedient to what they've called us to. And we think about our own lives and our own ways. If you come in here today and you have a mother, if you're younger, if you're a teenager, if you're even older, how do the words that you speak to your mother honor her? How, do, do, how you live, how does it honor her? How do we encourage our mothers with the promise that God's given us in being respectful and being obedient? In the Old Testament, it was actually a capital offense to curse your parents. Imagine if right now, if, if for us in this day and age, how many of you would still be alive today if we practiced stoning right now for cursing your father and your mother? How many of y'all would be here today? Raise your hand. 
couple of y'all lying in church. But we think about for us the, the seriousness and severity of honoring your parents, being respectful, being obedient to our mothers and fathers. Obviously, when we speak of obedience, in the sense we're talking about as long as we are never called to go against the word of God, we are to obey and we are to submit to the authority of those that have been put in our path. But we should never, if ever put to the law of man and the law of God, should we ever surrender to the law of man, we should always surrender to the law of God and praying that we can surrender to our, our family just the same. But there's also another unique provision here that's very different than our culture. Because back in the Old Testament, the children would be raised up in an effort to take care of their elderly parents when they got older. And so when you honor your father and your mother, one of the ways that you do that is you care for your mother as she gets older in life and as she needs more help and more provision and more financial provision, all of these things. We, unfortunately, are losing and moving away from that as we now live in a culture, uh, right or wrong, that's different in the sense that most of the time our parents are passing down things to us and taking care of us in their exit on to be with the Lord. But in times past, the greatest provision that a, a son and a daughter could give to their mother was to take care of them all the days of their life. And you think about how we're doing this today, where I, I am heartbroken to think about the many mothers that are sitting in nursing homes today with very few visits from their children. And we think about how do we honor our family, how do we love well, when it talks about the days may go long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. What God is saying here, he's saying that when we respect, obey the authorities that God's put in our path, those that love us, and when we take care of them, the length of life continues to be established and grown. And for the nation of Israel, it will go well for them as they obey the word of God. I don't know about you, but I grew up in a home where I was told several times, it will go well for you if you obey. And there were several times where it did not go well for me because I did not obey. I still remember certain times where my parents, this is how probably ancient I have become, but my mom would have people over to play bridge, um, which I don't even know what that is. It's a car game. That's all I know. And my, and my mom would be like, you know, stay in the back. Don't be disruptive and do all these things. And my sweet mom, I would have to deal with me knowing what's about to happen because I would go and transform into Superman. And I'd go flying through the room where they were all playing bridge and just fly around and run around and cause a scene and make a mess. And my mom would just shake her head and put it down and just be like, That's, the boy just don't listen. And so, but you think about the sweet memories that we have in honoring our parents and the ways that, that we want to do things in any way, shape, or form to get their attention, to show them that we're here and that we're present, that we love them and that they love us and they will do anything for us. And we honor them along the way, uh, but understanding that as we were respectful to them and obedient to them and want to take care of them, that life will go well. And I think about Mary, the mother of Jesus. And you think about her life and you think about what God had placed upon her, even if you think about the burden. At the privilege, yes, we celebrate the privilege, but we can't miss the burden that was put on such hardship for a mom. I think about Mary's life and I think about how she was, as the word of God says, she was chosen and she was favored by the Lord to give in such a great mission and such a great task. She was visited by the angel Gabriel, and the angel Gabriel came to her, letting her know that she would fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah 7, 14, that she would be a virgin with child and that she would give birth to the Messiah. And going through all of this wrestling with through what in the world is going on, where Gabriel's response to her is simply that nothing is impossible for God. And Mary's response to the angel Gabriel and to the plan of God for her life, I think, is even more miraculous. Because the words that she says are, I am your servant. Let it be according to your word. Now, you have to imagine Mary during this time and during this season where she is visited by an angel. Highly unlikely for people to believe her story when she comes back. But given and to be with child, you know, to where she would be giving birth to the Messiah. But having to go back and tell her fiancé, to go back and tell her family, and tell this story and the fear of what could come, the, the, the judgment and, and the ridicule that might come to her for those that don't believe in what God is doing. All the fear, all the things that she's wrestling with in this moment, but yet her total surrender to the Lord to saying, let it be according to your word. 
And as life began to unfold, even as everything went according to the plan of God, as she was living, it says in the Word of God in Luke's Gospel that as life unfolded, she treasured it all up in her heart. And she knew that all generations would call her blessed because of what was about to take place. But the thing that I ask is that did she know? Did she know what was going to happen to the son that she was going to be given? Did she understand the prophecy that was in Genesis chapter 3? Because in Genesis 3.15, after the curse uh, that came through sin, the Word of God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Here we see, obviously, that there is victory that will come in the Messiah, but did she understand that she was the woman that this passage was talking about? And did she understand the pain that was going to take place for her son in these moments and during this time and during the lifetime that she would have to see? We don't know a lot about Mary. We're not really given a lot of information about what she felt. We're left to speculation and to see uh, how life unfolded. But what we do know from Mary is that Mary was a wonderful mother to her son, loved him well. Not only that, but even when he was wandered and lost as they were trying to leave, she fleed and went back. I equate this to our day and age where if your child runs into the clothing rack into the shopping center and you have lost them and you don't know where they go and you're running around frantically and they pop out and say, surprise! And then you are torn whether to be excited that your child revealed themselves or you want to beat them half to death because of what they've done. And y'all just don't email me on that. I'm just kidding. I ain't going to beat my kid in the, in the shopping mall. I'll wait till we get home. I'm just kidding. <laughs> But you think about, but even for her, the care and concern of pursuing her child, finding him, making sure he's okay, exploring and even seeing that, that he was in his father's house and he was there teaching and learning and growing. But yet even Jesus in those moments being submissive to a loving mother who cared about where her son was during that time. But where we see uh, Mary next is truly extraordinary for two fronts. I think it's extraordinary for Mary being where she was and it's even more spectacular to see Jesus' love for his mother in this hour. But we find Mary at the foot of the cross of Jesus at a time where Jesus has, has, is give, getting ready to give up his life. He's getting ready to, he's taking upon the sin of the world. He's going to shed his blood and die so that we can have the forgiveness of sin, so that salvation can be won through putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ so victory over sin and death could take place. But here's a mom who didn't ask for her son to have to be the one to go through this, but she's there. She's there recognizing, understanding that her very presence could cause her harm, but she was still there wanting to be with her son, a son who was giving up his life for all creation to make and restore us to right relationship with the Father, a perfect, sinless life that he took to the cross, taking upon our sin, dying in our place, being raised three days later to defeat sin and death so that we, by faith, may put our trust in Christ as Lord and Savior for salvation. And Mary was present in this time and being willing to be a strong mother, loving her son to go do the impossible. And I think about Mary sitting in that place, thinking about the life that she just experienced and saw of her son, an extraordinary life. A life of a mother that all of you around those, those conversations with other mothers, she was the one that could not be outdone. And you think about it, right? So you think about if, if you're in a room with your mothers and you're talking about, you know, well, my kid started walking when, she, when he or she was nine months old. And then here's Mary just sitting quietly. She's like, well, Jesus walked on water, so I don't know really what else you got to say about that. Then you think about us being down here in the South and, you know, you think about, you know, you be proud of your children. And, and I mean, this is just a loose analogy. It's all I could come up with, but I'll give it to you anyway. And you think about, you know, well, my kid makes great sweet tea. And Mary thinks for a minute. She's like, well, my son turned water into wine, so I'm going to take that over your sweet tea here any day, right? Or you think about when you talk about being bragging about, you know, my son's a doctor. Well, you know, my son raised Lazarus four days after he was dead and brought him back to life. Oh, no matter what you throw at Mary, Mary can very easily and quickly look to you and say, you know what, you're right. 
Because we could talk about how we could give birth to, I say we, sorry baby, I, I can't do nothing like that. But you have children, you want them to be president, you want them to be big, big named, you want all these different things. And she's like, my son is Lord. My son is Lord, but it costs me my son. And we think about Mary being at the foot of the cross. But what is so extraordinary is Jesus taking notice of his mother while he's up on the cross. Listen to these words from John 19, verses 26 and 27. It says, When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, and that disciple is John, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Here we see Jesus in the midst of his toughest hour, remaining faithful to the command to honor your mother. Here you see Jesus not considering and making excuses because of what's going on in his life to where he can't honor his mother in this moment because he's so consumed with what he's going through. He doesn't model that for us. He doesn't scoff at the command being angry with God because he was told to honor his mother, but yet he's not going to do that because God's not honoring him or allowing injustice to happen in his life. There's no excuse of Jesus in this moment to do what God had commanded him to do, but he chose the disciple John. Now, what's interesting about this is the fact that Jesus had other half-brothers and sisters that he could have called upon, but he called upon John, the disciple whom he loved, whom he trusted, but also who believed in him. And that's important because up until this point, it is believed that, that Jesus' brothers and sisters to this time did not believe in Jesus. Even his brother James did not come to believe until later. And Jesus is entrusting his mother to the disciple whom he loved, to, to John here in this situation. And John stepped up and took initiative to love his mother for him. Sometimes for us, it's love and respect of other people. It's not necessarily in blood, but it is in honor of the Lord. And we see John stepping up to care for Jesus' mother, knowing that she was getting ready to be a widow. Which took me to James chapter 1. As you think about James, the brother of Jesus, as he writes this letter and he shares these words, and I think about how he must be thinking about his own mother. Because at the point of the cross where Jesus was, James, to be, to be believed, not a believer, not present, probably not interested in what's going on, and certainly not there for his mother at the time. But coming to faith later and recognizing how Jesus loved his mom, even in the, as being a widow, as Joseph had gone on, he writes these words in James 1.27. He says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction, to keep oneself unstained from the world. Jesus visited his mother in her affliction, but her affliction was his incoming death. But yet he still took the time to love her. And not only did he keep himself unstained from the world, he was perfect. And how James is writing these words, probably thinking about his brother, but also very mindful of his mother. His mother who never lost faith. We never see, we never learn or think of any time where she ever felt that she was owed something for her faithfulness. That God, how could you allow me to go through this and watch my son go to the cross and to die when I said to you that I am your servant, I will do whatever you ask of me. And she never looked in that season, in that time, thinking she was owed or that she should be spared of anything. In actuality, she actually did something even more miraculous in the sense that she actually went above and beyond and was present in Acts chapter 1 at the inception of the church as the disciples and others all gathered together to, to wait upon the Spirit of God to come so that the beginnings of the church could be formed. And the mother of Jesus was with them at the inception of the church. She understood what God had asked of her. And she rised up and said, so be it, and was present and was there. 
And Jesus modeling for us how to love and honor our mother, even in his darkest hour, we see strength in both. We see strength in the mother and we see strength in the son. And how do we, what do we do with all of this? How do we learn from this? And what are we supposed to take away from here today? Just some three simple things that I thought of and, and prayed over for you as I want to challenge you today as you leave here to honor your mother. The first thing is really just simple. We're commanded to do so. You're commanded to honor your mother. And even if you're here today and your mother is no longer with us, the greatest way to honor your mother is to ensure that her legacy lives on through the way that you live your life. That we can honor our mothers, even if they have gone on to be with the Lord, that we can do that through the way that we live our life. And I pray in the way that she taught you, which is in the way of the Lord. But we are commanded to do so whether we feel the condition is right or whether we feel that we are right. Because conditionally, sometimes maybe we look at the situation and maybe our mothers are not worth being honored. And I'm here to challenge you and to tell you that not only are you commanded to, but you should also see and understand that she is worth it. In both of these situations, we can wrestle with this and we can look to this. If you have a mother, maybe that is estranged or separate or distant or disconnected, but we've been commanded to and we've been called that she is worth our respect, our obedience, and our support. Because conditionally, we could look at a situation and say, well, they don't deserve my love. They don't deserve my respect. They don't deserve any of these things that they're asked of of Scripture because they did nothing for me. I didn't see that from Jesus, and I didn't see that from Mary, and I don't think we should see that in ourselves. We could look at the situation and say, well, I might be commanded to, but I I don't believe that, that they've earned it or they deserve it because of the way they treated me. I don't feel like it. Well, I think Jesus had every excuse in the world to say that he didn't feel like honoring his mother in that moment, consumed by what he was going through, but he chose to do it anyway. And so when we look to this and we see the commands that we are to give and to love and honor our mothers and to understand that she is worth it. Now, I'm speaking from a standpoint of a son who knows that his mama is worth it, that she loved me unconditionally, that she still loves me unconditionally, that she is still my greatest cheerleader, that she is still my biggest fan that I am a grown man about to start sobbing up here if I keep going on this issue. But my mother is worth everything I've got. But I also understand that I'm, I'm speaking from a place of privilege as it relates to that. And I can look and I can see these words and I can find comfort and strength as I pray that many of you do as well. That your mother is worth it based upon how she loved you. One of the things that we learn as we become parents is that being a parent doesn't mean that you are going to be perfect and that we need to surrender. And I believe the most humble things that I've learned about my parents is simply that as a parent, I've learned that I am not perfect. The things that I that I swore I would never do that I find myself doing. Even when I think about my dog and letting my dog out at night before I go to bed and how when I was a kid, I'd always hear my poor dad letting the dog out every single night, not really thinking about what he was doing. And then I find myself doing that very same thing at night and think about him and thinking about all the things that he would do for us that would go unnoticed and probably even um, wouldn't even be encouraged for. They were just done. And I think about moms and I think about all the things that they do that we miss that we don't see because so much of the work is done when we don't remember, right? The sleepless nights, the countless days of, of, of anxiousness and, 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 and life and safety and ensuring and trusting and not only the sleepless nights when they're little, but when they get older and they become teenagers and young adults and you're sleepless and you're worried until they come home and they come walking through the door to ensure that they are okay that we think and wonder about our mothers and how much they love us and care for us based upon the heart that they have for us. A heart that even God says, if you think the heart and love of a mother is great, think about the love that I have for you. And we think about how wonderful our mothers can be and how loving they are. But I want to speak to the moms because this is something that I've learned that I've walked through um, in my time as as a husband and as a father, 
when we think about being a mom, I, I need all of you moms to, to understand one thing. You are not perfect. And you are not expected to be. How you expect perfection of yourself every day, I don't understand. As I think about Alex, this is her first time becoming a mom. And the pressures that she's walking into of being a mom and and feeling the need to be perfect. Take a deep breath. You're not going to be. But it's okay. You're going to be exactly who they need. And for all of you moms, you are exactly who your children need. Let go of the mom guilt. Let go of the, the feelings of you didn't do enough. You didn't care enough. You weren't there enough. All the things that you live in bondage where the lies of the enemy creep in to make you feel that you are not worthy. And I'm here to tell you that God declared you worthy when he gave you a child. And we make mistakes. We do good. We do bad. But we do our best. We never give up on our kids, and we love them well. But our identity is in Christ It is in Christ alone that we find our worth and our value. And so for some of us, especially for some of our mothers today, you are not worthy, but he is. And you are worthy because he declared you to be so. But maybe if you're here today and maybe you have a a, a strange relationship with your mother, how you work through this is you understand that he is worthy and you surrender to him. And you honor him. I think about the words of Jesus as he says, those who love their father and mother more than me, he they is not worthy of me. So when we begin to think and put and elevate our fathers, our mothers, our children above the Lord, Jesus is saying that this idol worship and you are not worthy of me. And as I read that, I even think about even the idea of a wonderful mother or father that we missed out upon can pull us away from our relationship with the Lord. And I'm here to tell you that the Lord is above all else. He is above the bad relationships. He's above the good relationships. He is above the sweet times and the hurtful times. He is above all times because he is above all things. And he is worthy. And with that, I leave you with this. There are no excuses to this. As we leave here today and we think about honoring our mother, we should simply do it because we are commanded to do so. We do it because she is worthy. And maybe if you're walking a tough life situation right now where maybe she's not in your eyes, he is worthy. Honor your mother. And lastly, there are no excuses. The command is not conditional and it's not optional. It's clearly presented to us to accomplish and to obey. The worthiness is, rests upon the, Lord, the word of the Lord, not upon you, not upon your parent. And there are no excuses. Jesus gave none, and we are to bear his image and do what he's called us to do. And so we are not to leave with excuses of why we can or why we can't. But we are to honor our mother. And so I pray that you are encouraged today through the life of Mary and through the life of Jesus to help us to see how we can honor our mother. Mary gave up everything in Jesus for you and for me 2,000 years later. Think about that. Mary endured. Mary watched her son die, but trusted the Lord in that process because she knew what was to come, which was salvation for all who would believe. May you be a Mary, and may we all be a Jesus as we look to honor the Lord with our life And we honor the Lord even more greatly as we honor our sweet mothers. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to come to celebrate the moms in our life. We celebrate those wonderful individuals, God, who you have blessed to have children. And God, we just pray right now that, Father, we would do our part to love and to honor those who have loved us so wonderfully, so unconditionally. God, may we honor you in the way that we love others. God, may we do what you have called us to do, which is to be obedient to your word, to be obedient to our calling. And God, may we help our moms to see how much we love them. 
But Father, I pray a special prayer for those who, whose mothers are not with us. And Father, they do not have the blessing and privilege to be able to leave here today to go and to speak to them, to encourage them, and to share their love for them. But Father, I pray that their life would, would live and represent the legacy of their mother to show they love them. And God, I pray that for all of us, that God, the mistakes that we have made, the short comings that we have, Lord, the ways that we have missed out on honoring our mothers, that, God, we would put that behind us, and today would be a new day where we move forward. We honor the Lord by honoring our moms. And I pray for those sweet women, Father, and those sweet couples, God, that are asking and pleading and begging to become parents, that, God, you would open wounds today, that, God, you would give favor and blessing today for those who ask. And, Father, that I would pray for the hearts of people, for those countless children in foster care in need of homes, that, God, people would be raised up to be mothers and fathers to those that are in need, to those that might have been abandoned, so that we might be the representation of Christ and his worthiness through standing in the gap and loving someone who feels unloved. God, no matter the direction, there are no excuses we are all called to accomplish this great commandment to honor our father and mother. And I pray that as we do that, we will see your goodness. We will see your steadfast love and faithfulness in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.